All right, so we are going, we're going live now. Um, one, two, three. I, I just wait for, for my uh, sign, okay, Mohammed? When you're ready, I will let you know. Shall I press continue? Yeah, uh, wait for one second, Professor, if you don't mind, okay. sorry. And uh, we'll allow Mohammed to, to start first, and then uh, we'll ask you to share your screen. Okay, Mohammed Ahmed Mark, go ahead. Bismillah yeah. ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Diyufana al-Aizza. Ma'ali Sayyid Safir Jamhuriyat al-Sudan in Australia. ضيوفنا الكرام مرحبا بكم يشرفنا جدا وجود معالي السفير وعاونه الدائم لنا في كل المشروعات لنقل التكنولوجيا والمعرفه للسودان. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Of course, responsibility for soil and water are related resource conservation is more heavily on every succeeding generation. As our population mounts, and our land and water problems multiply. Thus, it is the sober obligation of the current generation to prepare the neck so well that it will discharge its conservation responsibilities more wisely and effectively than Mohammed Ahmed, Mohammed, can you uh, unmute yourself, please? Sorry. Unmute yourself now. Go ahead. Today, we are pleased to welcome a very special guest, Professor Martin Williams, Emeritus Professor at the University of Adelaide, Australia. His particular contribution to the field involved using evidence from a wide variety of disciplines to reconstruct prehistoric environments ranging from the habitats occupied by early hominids in the Afar Rifit of Ethiopia, to the Neolithic occupation in the Sahara and Nile Valley. In the conservation, in the conversation we will get to have, Prof. Martin will be sharing with us his expert opinion, rich knowledge on Sudan soil, which started since 1964 around Rosaris Dam. Please join me in welcoming Professor Martin Williams. Professor Martin, please, tafaddal. Uh, unmute yourself, Professor, uh, Prof. Go ahead. Good. So I'll press on the PowerPoint now. Okay. You can see that. I pressed on the PowerPoint. Could you see that? Not yet. Oh, I can't. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Um, I just want to share screen. Just uh, keep yourself yeah. mute, please. Shall I unmute? No, no, you're 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 fine. Just if you can, just um, uh, share your screen. It's um, a, a green icon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, at the bottom, and just uh, make sure to. Sh uh, yep. And yes. uh, PowerPoint now. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Uh, for the audience, if you can just let me uh, make sure to to uh, uh, to 
provide the instructions for for uh, for our talk today. So if you don't mind, can just make sure to keep your uh, self muted during this presentation until we uh, advise otherwise. So go ahead, Professor. Okay, good. Well, first, it's a great honor and a great pleasure um, and a delight, in fact, to be here. I first worked in the Sudan in 1962 and I was working on the Rosiris Dam project as a soil surveyor, mapping the soils along the lower White Nile and the lower Blue Nile, the Rahad and the Dinda. And from 1962 to 1964, I carried out soil surveys. Now, when I first arrived in the Sudan in October 1962, the very first thing I was told by the people from the Gazira research station in Wad Medni was very straightforward. They said, you'll have no problems. The Gazira is a uniform flat clay plain. All you have to do is imagine a square grid and have each of your soil pits or auger holes, barima, um, in the center of these holes and just carry out your surveys. Well, within the first week, I realized, as did my friends, colleagues with me, that the gazira was not flat, it was not uniform, and it was not always clay. So what I want to do is explain to you why. So my aim in this talk is, first of all, to encourage you to think about issues you may never have previously considered. And in the process of doing that, I want to show you how and why the Gazira is not a flat and uniform clay plain. It's much more interesting, it's much more exciting. So in part one of the talk, I'll talk about the role of the Blue Nile. In part two, I'll talk about the role of a very much neglected river, the White Nile. And in part three, I'll just give a brief summary and conclusion. And I've been asked to say a few additional words about looking to the future and what are the key principles that should underlie sustainable use of our natural resources. So that's my aim. Now, there's been a lot written about the Nile, and I've been guilty of doing the same. One of the great inspirations to me was Julian Joschka's book, simply called The Nile, which dealt with the biology, and there were a large number of Sudanese contributors to that book. Then in 1980, I co-edited a book called The Sahara and the Nile, um, published in Holland by Balkama. And two years later, I tried to summarize in another edited book with a number of Sudanese colleagues what we knew about the Gazira, which I simply called A Land Between Two, two Niles. That was published in 1982. <coughs> a little later, I gave a light, a light hearted account of my time in the Gazira, meeting the grandson of the Mahdi, um, the way our ideas evolved through time, right up till 2012 when I was working up in Nubia. And that was simply called Nile Waters, Saharan Sands, uh, published by Springer and not very expensive with a lot of color photos. And then a couple of years ago, I published a big book simply called The Nile Basin, Cambridge University Press, where I thought I'd put together everything I'd learned over the last um, nearly 60 years for the benefit of future generations. Because of it, and it was work, obviously not simply my own, but many, many colleagues, friends from Sudan and from other parts of the world. And a nice little book, a successor to the Joshka book on the Nile is Henri Dumont's book simply called The Nile, which deals with the hydrology. And we have three chapters in there as well. So go to Google, go to Amazon, Take a stiff drink of tea before you look at the prices and move on. So part one, the role of the Blue Nile. The first thing is 
the Blue Nile is a very old river. It's 30 million years old. It's been carrying sediment from the Ethiopian highlands down to the Mediterranean for 30 million years. In the process, it's eroded 150,000 cubic kilometers of rock from Ethiopia. That's the Blue Nile and the APRA. And at Kassala, Jebel Kassala, those granites have been exposed in the last 30 million years by continuing erosion. So on the left there, you can see the Ethiopian highlands, and that's very close to the headwaters of the Tekeze, this area here in Ethiopia. Now, this is a very simplified map, so don't worry about the uh, boundaries. They're somewhat poetic. This is the Gezira irrigation area, as it was in the 1970s. And the Tissisat Falls in Ethiopia and the Blue Nile at low water season. And then one of the great canals fed by Blue Nile water um, after the uh, Sanaa Dam was built. And then, of course, later the Waziris Dam. Now, it's worth remembering that the APRA and the Blue Nile between them provide something like 97% of the sediment carried by the Nile, which before regulation, before dam building, reached the sea, something like 100 million tons of silt and clay. The White Nile contributed a miserable 3 million tons. However, in the winter, the APRA used to dry up before the Kashmogilba Dam was built. And it's the White Nile itself that in the low water season provides over 85% of the flow of the Nile River. In dry years, if there was no White Nile, the main Nile would dry up. And we tend to forget that. And there have been occasions in historic times and in dynastic times in Egypt when in fact flow from the Nile has almost ceased because the Nile, the White Nile, for a few decades stopped flowing. So that's something to bear in mind. Now, the area I want to talk about, of course, is the Gezira. And I'll draw it to your attention, the area in big red capitals, Eshawal, a little village. We'll come, come to Eshawal because it contains the answers to a number of puzzles, including questions of subsoil salinity. So this is the area here. And we'll focus initially on the Blue Nile, and then we'll move over to the white. Now, what we tend to forget, and it's clear on this um, early satellite image, it's not a particularly good image, but it was the first one that was locally processed in the Sudan. And in red, uh, it's not a photograph, it's based on wavelengths. The false red is in fact irrigated cotton. And at that time of the year, in those in the early 60s, two thirds of the export revenue of Sudan came from less than 1% of the land area, specifically the Gezira. And later I'm gonna suggest that that's relying on one crop can be dangerous. What I want you to notice are these white patches and this big area here. These are sand dunes. <coughs> and we tend to forget that they're not desert dunes. They were brought in, the sand was brought in by these ancient channels of the Blue Nile, which have been flowing across the Gezira until the Blue Nile began to cut down vertically 8,000 years ago. And the flooding of the Gezira ceased after that. So there's been no effective addition to the Gezira clay since that time. The other thing I want to draw to your attention briefly is this hatched area here, north of Wad Medni, past Hasahesa and up um, on the way to El Masid, but it doesn't reach. That is volcanic ash. That is an 
ancient channel of the Blue Nile that was choked with volcanic ash from a huge eruption in Ethiopia about 100,000 years ago, and then the Blue Nile changed course. Is that so, area, Professor Martin, what we call it, Barranco, the one next to Hasahisa, the volcanic? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Barranco. correct. Okay. Yeah. And on the other side of the river from Hasahesa, if you look on the east bank of the Blue Nile, you can see some beautiful sand dunes. Now, those sand dunes are forming today still, a low water season, with the sand brought in by the Blue Nile, the channel sand, the bed load, blown up to form these dunes in exactly the same way that the El Gatena dunes, the Naima dunes, the dunes that extend up to Jebel Alia, were formed during the dry season by strong winds blowing the channel uh, sands out of these highly seasonal rivers. So it's worth bearing in mind that we're not looking at desert dunes, we're looking at what are called source bordering dunes. The, clay, the heavy mineral content of the dunes around Gatena is Ethiopian. They, they are derived from Ethiopia. Okay. Now, the early British geologists working in the Sudan were impressed by the Haboob. And anyone who's experienced a Haboob will be impressed by it. It's a wall of sand. It can be 5,000 meters, 10,000 meters high on a front of 20 kilometers, advancing at you know, 50 to 100 kilometers an hour, dust coming from the north during the dry season. So they were impressed by the great dust deposits in North America and in Europe and said, okay, the Gazira was formed by windblown dust. Now, in fact, we've known since 1946 and even earlier, the great work of J.D. Tothill, the former director of agriculture and his wonderful book, Agriculture in the Sudan, published in 1948, there are freshwater snail shells all along the, within the clays of the Gazira, along the Blue Nile and along the White Nile. And these shells, these snails were alive and living 11,000, 12,000, 15,000 years ago. So in fact, the Gazira is a very large, low angle inland alluvial fan deposited by the Blue Nile with assistance from the Dinda and the Rahad. And this is this process of deposition of the Gezira formation began 30 million years ago. And so at depth, you have these ancient channels that were mapped by Yazim Abdul Salam for his master's thesis, University of Khartoum. And on the surface today, you've got these sandy channels avoided by agriculturalists, but used by the local villagers. And these sandy areas have been used from prehistoric times onwards. The soils within them, of course, uh, they're overlain, capped by clay, but at shallow depth, they're sand and they're very permeable. So a canal put through and across these will lose water. Here's um, just north of Medany, the modern Blue Nile, and you can see the part of the volcanic ash. And this has happened periodically. The Blue Nile has periodically received great quantities of ash from volcanic eruptions in Ethiopia. And it's modified the soils. Once it weathers, they become very fertile soil, but it takes a long time to weather. Now, something that we tend to be unaware of is that the climate in the headwaters of the Blue Nile and the Apra has alternated consistently between cold and dry and warm and wet. And during the drier climatic intervals, both the Blue Nile and the Apra were far more seasonal and they carried mainly a bedload of sand and gravel. 
A lot of that gravel has been deposited in Nubia, Northern Sudan, Southern Egypt during the dry intervals. During the wetter intervals, for reasons I'll explain shortly, the river or both rivers at and Blue Nile became what we call suspension load rivers, transporting primarily silt and clay. And this silt and clay was carried through Egypt during the summer season, during the Harif, it flooded the floodplains. And two and a half thousand years ago, Herodotus said, Egypt is the gift of the river. In fact, the word Nile comes from an old Egyptian word, which simply means the river. El Nil is simply the river, because to the ancient Egyptians, there was only one river flowing through a desert. So let's look at the Blue Nile 20,000 years ago, 21,000 years ago. This was a time when most of Northwestern Europe was covered in ice, two or three kilometers of ice. Chicago was buried beneath four kilometers of ice. And there was very much less summer rain. The Harif was only maybe a month or two. The winters were at least four degrees cooler, probably eight degrees. There were glaciers in the headwaters of the Blue Nile down to 4,200 meters, but the slopes were unstable down to 3,000 meters. So a great deal of coarse debris was brought into the headwaters of the Blue Nile and the Apra. The tree line was 1,000 meters lower. There was very high seasonal runoff, very high peak flows, massive floods, probably quite a lot of loss of life at that time for the people still living there, and much less annual discharge. And in the winter, the winds blew the channel sands out of the rivers and formed the dunes that I've referred to earlier. When we move to 9,000 years ago, and this process began at 14, the summer monsoon has been re-established. Summer rainfall is much higher. The wet season is longer. In fact, at 9,000, it was wetter in the Sudan than it is today, very much wetter. The winters are now warmer. Tree line is higher. The slopes are now vegetated and stable above 3,000 meters. Savanna lowland penetrated into what was previously desert. The soils developed and provided the silts and clays to the river. Higher annual discharge, a higher base flow, this is the subsurface flow, which meant that the great flood peaks were buffered, were reduced, and there was permanent flow and widespread flooding across the Gezira and across um, the whole of the main Nile into Egypt. So throughout its history, we've had this alternation between cold, dry, warm, wet, gravel and sand versus silt and clay. Now, an interesting thing, I come now to the role of the White Nile. I've commented on these channels already, the ancient channels of the Blue Nile, but when you come to the village of Artimeli, which is here, all of a sudden, these ancient channels change their pattern. They become extremely sinuous, even more sinuous than the present Blue Nile in certain areas. And the obvious question to ask is why? Professor, Professor, I mean, there is a lot of technical people who would be able to, uh, what do you mean by sinuous? It's just um, instead of being straight, curved. Okay. Meandering. See the way the river is doing that? Yes. Here it's straight. Yes. And all of a sudden, below the elevation of 382 meters, it becomes a curved river or a series of rivers. These are a series of channels. <clears throat> and the answer is because though those channels were flowing on the exposed floor of a former White Nile Lake. And I'll explain how that lake came into being. In fact, periodically, the whole of the lower White Nile Valley has been flooded. 
and has formed a lake. So I'll explain the significance of this first by looking at a problem that's perennial in this region, salt. You can see the salt and you can see the rather miserable cotton crop. Now, it's often assumed that the high salt concentration in the soil is because of the present day climate, arid, semi-arid climate. That is not the case. And the reason for why we have this salt has been ignored. And it's one I want to now explain. 14,000 years ago, there was an enormous lake extending right through the White Nile Valley, the lower White Nile Valley. And the reason for the lake was because there were major floods in the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile backed up and prevented the water from the White Nile from flowing until the Blue Nile flood had receded. Once the lake dried out, which began soon after 13,500 years ago, areas in the depressions, which I show you here, hatched areas, these are the Maya, um, concentrated the salts dissolved in the water of this huge river. And over time, the salt in the sediments became hypersaline. Later, these areas were buried beneath about a meter, a meter and a half of non-saline clay from the floods of the White Nile during the flood season. But what it means is that there are certain areas quite localized where if you try and develop, if you try and grow, um, say, sugar, sugar plantation, and you put canals through these, within two or three years, you'll be bankrupt. The plants will die. So that's what you might call historical hangover, a legacy from the past, which is there with us. And in order to understand the present, you really need to understand the past. Sorry, Professor, is that the same case in the South area? Why a jungle cannot plant to be? Um, it's very similar. And can I answer that in a moment? Or do you want me to answer it now? Okay, I'll answer it's it It's up to you, whenever it suits you. No, no, yeah. whenever it suits you. Uh, okay. I thought you were muted, but obviously you aren't. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Sud, the amount of water coming into the Sud, from Uganda and through the Bahr el Ghazal, the Bahr el uh, Giraffe, and so on, half of that water disappears from evapotranspiration and from um, seepage. And yet the salt concentration in the water leaving the Sud is the same as that entering. The concentration is the same, composition different. Now that that effectively means that half of the salt has already been absorbed by the plants and microorganisms in the sud. And the sud itself is, in fact, best described as a gigantic biogeochemical filter. Uh, that's a, a grand way of simply saying it filters sediment and it modifies the chemical composition of the water. So, during the early work for the Jonglai Canal, the reports produced showed that at quite shallow depth in the Sud, the soils are very salty, very saline. And you may recall there was a plan some years ago to drain the Sud. And the slogan at the time was, more water for the north, more land for the south. Now, the effects of draining the sud would have been three. A, you would expose very saline soil, so the locals wouldn't benefit from particularly good soil. B, you change the chemical composition of the White Nile water, which would affect the plants. And thirdly, you change the flow regime of the White Nile, which would erode the banks and cause the pump, the outlet inlet pipes of the private pump projects to collapse. 
So, okay. Now this is a transect from Eshual for 11 kilometers to the east to a little, couple of little granite hills called Jebel Twemat, the twins. And what you can see here is the modern clay and then sandy clay and then sand. So you've got layers of very widespread sand at quite shallow depth. And then you go down to this, what I've shown in blue here, which is extremely interesting because it's microcrystalline calcite and dolomite at a depth of five, six meters, which is highly saline, very, very salty. And it formed during the last dry phase from 30,000 through to 20,000 years ago. So it, the parent in which it occurs is a clay, and it is the daughter. And so there's a lot of complexity within the soils. And to use them intelligently, you need to understand not simply the nature of the complexity, but the reasons for the complexity. I've mentioned earlier that periodically the White Nile has formed these huge lakes. This is south of Jebelain. You probably know this area and Renk here, Kerikara here. These are shorelines at 386 meters. This is false color satellite imagery. And the areas shown in white are sandy. They're the old shorelines of the White Nile when it formed a lake 800 kilometers long and 120 kilometers wide, which would have made it probably the biggest lake in the world at that time. This was 110,000 years ago. Up here, you've got well-drained soils in red with sorghum. Down in here, less well-drained, and you can see the fire scars where the old Harik system of agriculture was practiced. Yeah. So moving on, we tend to think, as I said earlier, that the Nile has been perennial throughout its long history. And that's very doubtful because the White Nile itself is a much younger river and probably no more than 400,000, maybe a bit less, which is about the age of Lake Victoria. And the White Nile itself um, dries out periodically. It dried out last 20,000 years ago when Lake Victoria was dry completely. Lake Albert was dry and there were soils developing on the floors of those lakes. Now we now have a very good record of high flood levels in the White Nile, more fragmentary for the blue, but you can see that they're pretty synchronous. Ka, by the way, means thousands of years. So we had big floods a thousand years ago, between about three and two, five and a half, six, between about 8.2, and right back to 15,400 with a periodicity of roughly 1500 years, which is linked to solar radiation, changes in solar radiation. There are shorter term cycles within those, a whole series of them, in fact. Now, I now want to look a little bit into the future. Some of you will remember that in July 1999, or 1998, um, there were major floods in the Gezira. The main canal, which you can see here north of Managil, broke its banks and flooded. And the hollows between all the dunes around El Gatena, down to Naima, up towards Jebel Olia, were filled with water, which was picked up by the satellite imagery of the, of the day. And when we look at the history of flooding in Khartoum and in the Gezira, for as long as rainfall records exist, what we've seen in the last 30 to 40 years is an increase in extreme flood events. And the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change report that was published last week, 
has indicated that for the whole of this region, extreme floods and extreme droughts are most likely to be the pattern of the future. And that's something we need to bear in mind. So, what, uh, what are the causes of these floods? Well, I could talk for that for hours, but I'll talk about one cause only. Notably, changes in sea surface temperature. Off the coast of Peru, there is a very cold ocean current and there's cold water coming to the surface, so very rich fishing. And for 500 years, the Peruvian fishermen have been keeping annual records. Periodically, this cold ocean current becomes warmer and the entire fishing industry collapses and there are major floods in Peru and they call these El Nino years, which is Spanish for the child, because it occurs around December. Now, during an El Nino year, if you look at the records from China, we've got a 500 year annual history for floods and droughts in China. Three main agricultural regions in China suffer extreme drought. If you look at Indonesia, which we tend to think of as being a very wet area, and look at the tree ring widths in the teak trees, Tictona grandis, narrow tree rings coincide with El Nino years and with drought in China, India, low flow in the Nile, and for the last hundred years, extreme drought in the eastern half of Australia. And so what we're looking at is what are called global climatic teleconnections, <coughs> excuse me, which are linked to a, a pattern of synchronous floods and droughts. Now, I'm not saying that all parts of the world were dry at those times. California during an El Nino year is extremely wet. But during the opposite, which we call La Nina, little girl, California is extremely dry. So is the Northern Mediterranean. And that's what we have today. Extreme bushfires in Turkey, Greece, Portugal, south of France, California, all the way up to Canada. And of course, the impact of global warming over the last hundred years, for whatever cause, and we can discuss that on another occasion, is exacerbating these um, cycles of periodic wet and dry years linked to changes in sea surface temperature, which in turn are probably linked to submarine volcanic eruptions. Now, following on from the discussion I had yesterday during the practice run, I was asked to look ahead and talk about some guidelines for the future in a couple of slides. And I've called this living with uncertainty. I wish that was Nile water, but it's Adelaide water. Um, we can expect more extreme climatic events like floods and droughts for the whole of this region. We therefore need to make far more flexible use of our soils, alluvial soils and other soils. And in particular, it's terribly important to make sure that suitable crop rotations are maintained. Don't reduce the number of rotations. If fallow is being practiced, don't reduce that. We have to optimize our use. We have to be much, we have to be clever in the way we use our resources. We need to diversify as much as possible. Don't rely on a single crop. Make greater use of halophytes, for example, for grazing. Um, halophytes are plants that absorb salt, that are salt tolerant. Minimum tillage. I was talking to a farmer in the highlands of Tunisia a few years ago, and he said, I practice minimum tillage. I don't destroy the 
um, stubble of the wheat at the end of the year. All my colleagues do and told me I was mad, but during the drought, although my yields are low, they don't get any crop and I get a good crop. So don't rely too much on single crops or cash crops, diversify. The trees that once grew luxuriantly on the dunes, both in Kordofan, Darfur, but also in the region around El Gatena, used to be forests of trees there. They've all been cut down. Some of them are being replanted now, things like Arak, Salvadora, Persica, um, but the Tundub, the Haraz, the Seal, it's been cut down. So please consider replanting the trees because they do well on these sandy soils. Avoid overuse of groundwater. The last major recharge of groundwater in the Sudan was between 15,000 and 12,000, 13,000 years ago. There's been no major recharge since, apart from the rivers. But the recharge from the White and Blue Nile, the water becomes progressively more saline as it leaves the river. So try and avoid overuse of groundwater. Be very cautious in developing areas with high subsoil salinity. I mean, one possibility is to actually mine the salt and um, manufacture salt. That's a possibility. Don't waste time rediscovering the wheel. What I mean by that is there's a great deal of information in the Sudan, in the old surveys, in the old maps, the old reports, the soil capability maps, the land capability maps. And there's no need to repeat that. You can improve on it, but don't forget the wisdom of the past. A great deal of work has been carried out already. And when mapping soils, I talk now to my soil surveyor colleagues in Sudan, don't just concentrate on the top meter or meter and a half because there's all the issues of subsoil salinity that I referred to earlier and the much the variability in the subsoil. So finally, make as much use as you can of remote sensing data wherever it's available. And so now, my final slide, the preconditions for achieving sustainable resource use. First, we have to realize that on this earth, there's only one source of a net increase in primary productivity, by which I mean plant biomass, and that's from the sun. Solar energy acting through photosynthesis, to increase plant matter. So we need to protect and ideally increase plant biomass. Everything else is simply recycling. You know, coal, iron, recycled into steel. So the two key principles are first, we should not systematically remove materials from any natural or humanly modified system at a rate faster than the ability of that system to replace them or replenish them. Soil erosion is an obvious example of that. Now I say systematically, deliberately, because obviously in some cases there will be removal. Provided it's localized and it's not continuous, it does not matter. And thirdly, we should not systematically add materials to a natural or humanly modified system at a rate faster than the capacity of the system to absorb and recycle those materials. Think of chemical pollution of soil, air, water, excess use of pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. In the short run, very good. In the long run, far more harm than good. And we need to think long term. So to summarize, the Gezira is an alluvial fan built up 
primarily by the Blue Nile during the last 30 million years. During warm, wet climatic intervals, the Blue Nile was a suspension load river carrying abundant clay. A lot of that clay is now trapped in reservoirs, of course. During cold, dry climatic intervals, the Blue Nile was a bedload river carrying sand and gravel. The White Nile is geologically a young river, only joined the Blue Nile about 400,000 or fewer years ago. During periods of extreme Blue Nile floods in the past, the White Nile became a seasonal lake and the drying out of that lake led to a buildup of salt in depressions, which were later covered over in non-saline clay. And the White Nile today flows across the bed of a former lake, the most recent lake. And that's why it has such a low flood gradient of a centimeter a kilometer, one in a hundred thousand. And that is the end. And these are my acknowledgements. Professor Osman at Tom and Dr. Yusuf al Samani from Grass, and Professor Yazim Abdul Salam, and of course the people of the Gazira. So we're now open to questions. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. Our first question from uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Lamin. I will uh, unmute you. Hold on just a second. Oh. And we, uh, so I will, uh, you know what, I'm uh, a little he, bit. No, he's, 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 he, I don't think he's connected with the, uh, with the audio. So maybe um, go to the next one. Uh, yeah, Hamad. Professor Azad, please. Uh, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for organizing this uh, valuable seminar. And thank you, Professor Martin Williams. You have given us a lot of insights about how the Blue Nile was developed and how the Jazeera was developed. I have uh, mainly two questions and one comment with regard to the flooding of the Blue Nile. There are also some other factors, which is also include the sea surface temperature also from the Indian Ocean and also very recently, I have begun to do some research on the impacts of atmospheric river on the flooding of the Blue Nile. And what I have found that in the years where you don't have a lot of atmospheric river, you will have drought. But the main question that I have for you is that is, as you have outlined in your presentation, you have mentioned that is flooding and sediment transport play a key role in, um, in the evolution of uh, the Blue Nile. Uh, as you may aware, that is, uh, Ethiopia is uh, constructing a big dam near the Sudanese border, that is the Gare Dam. <coughs> and some, um, um, some studies indicate that is, it will trap around maybe 85% of the sediment uh, coming uh, through, uh, through the Blue Nile to Sudan. Then the question, what will be the impact of uh, trapping huge amount of, uh, of, of, of sediments on the geomorphology of the, of the, of the, of the Blue Nile? Again, I think there are some uh, also information, some measurements which has been done by the Ministry of Irrigation during the first filling of the Gare Dam. They also indicated that is uh, uh, like around maybe 85% of sediment has been trapped uh, has, has been trapped by the gear dam. Then the other question is about the future of the Jazeera scheme. Because again, the Jazeera scheme, 40% um, of the sediments entering the Jazeera scheme through the canals will end up into the, um, into the, in, into the field. So this is will renew the fertility every year. Now with the gear, with the get down, we have a reduction in the sediment rate. And also we have also um, changes in the water quality. So how does that impact on the, on the Jazeera scheme? Thank you very much. You mentioned the change in water quality. What, yes. what, is, what is your evidence for that? And what, are the, what is the process? 
Well, I think uh, there might be because like uh, uh, th there is a lot of trees which has not been taken very well from the from the from the lake of the dam. But at the moment, there is the only evidence that is yeah. there That's is a sediment. Yes, That's yes, there is a sediment. Yeah, because you could have uh, you could argue that the the water in the Sanaa Reservoir and the water in the Raziris Reservoir also affected the salt, and there's no evidence of that. Yeah. Measurements taken for 60, 70 years uh, for Sanaa in the Blue Nile water. The trapping of the sediment is another issue. These days, most dams are built which allow sediment to be released. And you may recall that um, there was 30 years ago, 20 years ago in the Sudan, there was considerable concern that accelerated soil erosion in the Ethiopian highlands linked to deforestation was causing siltation in the Raziris Reservoir, the Raziris Dam Reservoir, and the Sanaa Dam Reservoir, and also, also Kashmir Girba from the APRA. And that's very true. Any um, body of standing water, a river flowing into it will build a delta. That's happened in Lake Nasa. Um, and it's unless there's a process which allows scouring of the delta and the silt to be transported through filters in the base of the, the dam itself, periodically, seasonally, that is, um, they can't be permanent or the dam wouldn't work, then this is an inevitable process with any dam. What impact it will have in the Gezira, um, I think only time will tell, because a relatively small amount of silt and clay was ever carried into the Gezira canals. And one of the problems that um, a number of early engineers were concerned about was if there's too much silt coming into the canal, then the canal might silt up. And that could be a problem. Um, more fundamentally is what will be the impact of future climate change on the amount of water coming to Sudan? During wet years, no problem. Plenty of water in the reservoir in Ethiopia, plenty of um, scope for water coming to the Sudan and to Egypt. During dry years, if they're prolonged series of dry years, there could be a problem. I think the only answer there is for men and women of goodwill, professional people from the three main countries affected, Sudan, Egypt, Ethiopia, to sit down, discuss the problem intelligently and sensibly, keeping the politicians away and coming up with a policy which will allow people to sustain a viable living even during times of prolonged drought. Because drought will always be with us. And, and it's like the um, biblical years of Yusuf in Egypt years ago. And so we need to plan and store during the wet years and optimize use of water in the dry years. But you've raised fundamental questions, and and Mohkabir and I will at Lisa. I'm not really in a position to give a detailed answer to your questions, but thank you for the question. I will let the Professor Martin Muhammad, if you don't mind, just I get a quick question for. Him. So you were, you mentioned earlier that there is some. I mean. What is going to happen is, I mean, as you said, we're going to have to mitigate uh, the risk or what's going to happen in the flood years and, and the dry years. Right? The question I have, there seems to be some sa sort of sand being deposited during the years. And as you mentioned, there is a difference between the sand deposited and the desertification, which is happening regularly in Sudan by chopping some trees and all that stuff. And it seems that this uh, soil or this type of sand is not that bad. I mean, we'll be able to cultivate something in it and try to make some music. 
and yes. uh, yes. will tie it. And if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and what could be, and I think you did, but and the other thing is also you mentioned that we are just using 1% of the available land in Sudan. And you, I know your main focus is the Nile, the water, Jazeera scheme itself, between the area from Rosaris all the way to the White Nile. Which other areas within, and just on a very high level, we don't want to get into, you know, this is a very uh, big uh, scope. Which areas which could be similar to the Jazeera? The Jazeera historically was a very successful agricultural scheme. Hmm. How would we be able to duplicate it? Well, the Gash is an obvious example. And floodwater irrigation in the Gash has been practiced for a very long time. Any alluvial soils, almost by definition, if they're clay rich or silt rich, will be very fertile, potentially fertile, will, will retain soil moisture. Now, earlier on, you alluded to sandy soils. Yep. In 1949, a forester called Smith ran a survey from southern, the, the, the far south of what was then Sudan, now South Sudan, up to the, the far north, a thousand kilometer transect. And what he, he looked at the distribution of acacia trees in relation to the percent of clay and the percent of sand in the, in the soil, in areas where the level areas where there was no runoff and no loss of water. And he concluded- of, If you don't mind, if you could share it like a, a slide where the, where the map, just to make everybody grounded as far as what we were talking about, as far as, you know. Shall I continue? Yeah, no, go ahead. But if you could put the like the put like a slide of the map of Sudan, just so that to make your you know. Oh well, I don't have one handy. I'd have to go right back to the beginning. In um, the beginning, yeah. People can imagine it. Okay, so what he found was that a particular species of acacia, acacia tree that on clay soil needed, let us say. 300 millimeters of rain a year. Growing on sandy soil, it only needed 200 millimeters of rain a year. And the reason for that was that the water in the sandy soils was more available to the plant roots, whereas the water held in the clay soils was under considerable tension and was less available for growth. So what that means is that Sandy, sandy areas and sand dunes in particular are almost optimum areas for growing trees and um, soils like uh, plants like duchun, for example, cereal crops like duchun, which can make use of relatively poor soil, low in nutrients. But as, as a general rule, the sandy soils are also non-saline and non-alkaline. Around Jabal Mara, there are huge areas which are being mapped in detail at the moment and have been for the last 15 years by a German company and British companies and Sudanese um, surveyors, which are derived from the weathering of the volcanic soils. And these are very high in potassium, they're very rich soils, and once Peace is restored to the area. And once you've rediscovered a symbiotic relationship between farmer and herder, then that'll become another of the agricultural bread baskets of the Sudan. There are a number of regions in the Sudan where you've got perfectly good soil, plenty of land, water is the limiting factor. But you know far more about all this than I do. So um, I've given a partial answer to a very important question. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and you don't, I mean, you're just being too humble in what you, you know a lot more than in, about Sudan and the soil in Sudan than a lot of people, even though we have, do have some uh, expert in the field, which uh, they would be able to chip in as well and hopefully we'll be able to make this a successful journey, so. Excellent. Yeah, we, we have some questions from our audience from Facebook. I'm waiting on those. 
so I can convey them to you. But in the meanwhile, we can take a question from uh, Dr. Muhammad al -Lamin. Muhammad, uh, can you please just ask the prof if you uh, discuss this while the map is there, so it will be easy to track it? Yes. Yeah. Could yeah. we please put the map up, Professor Martin? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah. For Dr. Muhammad al -Lamin, I think he didn't join with his audio yet, so I'm not sure if he will be able to ask his question. So if someone, okay. if you can reach out to him directly or someone can reach out to him, that will be great. But otherwise, uh, al Sadiq Ahmed, I think he's next. Is this what you want? Okay, yeah, I'm waiting. Yes, please. In yes, Professor Sadi, go ahead, please. Introduce okay. yourself Thank first. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad Omar and the organizer. Actually, it is very interesting and very thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, actually, the new dam in Asubia, there are many, many doubts that it's going to collapse one day. Uh, can you please uh, uh, explain us the soil com uh, composition of this dam? As the soil composition is, is, is it strong enough to keep the dam, or one day will be collapsed? Is there any biological weathering there? And uh, how does Sudan benefit from having this uh, dam to reduce the flood? Thank you very much. I'm. I am not an engineer, but I'm sure that the dam has been built very professionally, certainly not made of soil. Um, all dams, however big or small, are vulnerable to earthquakes. And that's something that you simply cannot predict with any confidence. And the same is true in the Sudan. There could be an earthquake, which could damage the Raziris Dam, it could damage the Kashmir Girba Dam, it could damage the, um, the dam at Meroe. These are something we just hope will never happen in our lifetimes. Dams are normally built in such a way that water can be released. In Australia, we've had some tragic cases of extreme flooding and the water was released too late and the dam collapsed and caused major loss of life. So dams by their very nature are hazardous structures. In terms of the um, impact on the soils and the water quality, I, I don't think there'll be much change in the water quality downstream. I think that the, the, the volume of water is huge that's stored behind that big dam. Um, changes in the amount of silt coming through, yes, that's true, that will occur. But again, I don't think it's a fundamental issue because in the Gezira, you've got perfectly fertile soil that's been there for 10,000 or more years that simply needs water, whether it's from rain or from irrigation, doesn't matter. The limiting factor for plant growth in the Gezira is not soil, it's water. So I think one should not be afraid of what I think are issues that won't arise. Any dam is potentially vulnerable. And that applies to any part of the world. That's not a very um, optimistic thing to say, but I think it's being realistic. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we'll give the chance for His Excellency, Excellency the Ambassador of Sudan to Canberra. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so here. much. We really uh, appreciate you. your efforts helping us. Thank you so much. I'm very glad really to take a part in this such a professional gathering. And uh, for me, it was so very imp informative one. And, uh, but uh, what I would like to say that I have been uh, impressed, you know, by a very uh, important point that uh, said by Professor Martin, when he mentioned, you know, the importance of, of uh, the need for the three uh, country to sit together so as to 
to find a solution to the what is going to be happen during, during, during the drier seasons. You know, uh, that is very important, by the way. And I do agree with that. It is a technical uh, uh, should be a technical vision rather than political one. Sure. So just I would like to emphasize on this the importance of these points, and we have to take that one very seriously. Mm. Thank you so much. This is just I want to add. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Okay, if there is no question, uh, there, is, there is a question from Dr. Ali Wuda'a from University of Khartoum. Dr. Uh, Ali, please. Okay. Firstly, I would like to thank Harakat Baladna for this great work, really. And then my thanks extended to Professor Martins for very interesting, really, uh, seminar. Uh, my question, according to the map, uh, of the Gazira, I think there is a dunes uh, in the eastern bank of White Nile. Also, you mentioned uh, that also this <coughs> bank affected by salinity. Uh, I think this, with the time, will crawl into the depths of Gazira scheme. Therefore, I think the Gazira scheme is threatened by these dunes in the, in the near future. So, my question: What do you see? to uh, stop uh, this uh, dunes or to, to stop this uh, dangers that will be happening in the near future. My second question is about the resident dams. I think also uh, the rainfall or the climate in general will be uh, changed. Uh, and expected that the rainfall will be increased in the, uh, due to the legs of uh, the dams. Also, this can be affected the, the sediment uh, that sediment uh, sediment net transported from the uh, island of Ethiopia. Also, this I, I think it will, will affect the Gazira soils. What do you see? Thanks. Um, Mohammed Ahmed. Yes. Would, can you hear me? Would you like to just summarize those two questions? Because I wasn't hearing very clearly. Yes. His second question was, uh, Dr. Ali is uh, from University of Khartoum. Yeah. He's a lecturer there. We graduated yeah. together at the same time, the same batch there. He talked in his second questions about the water, the silt deposit water coming to the Jazeera. He think that might affect the salinity in Jazeera soil because in some, in part of that process, the silt play a role in preventing the deposition of, of, of salt or something like that, or neutralize it, or uh, the, the silt that carried with water to the Jazeera scheme is what is stopping Jazeera soil from undergoing salinity. And he is afraid that after like restricting the movement of the silts because of the dam, that my impact negatively on Jazeera uh, soil. He also talked about those dunes uh, next to Jazeera, and he thinks they're moving towards eating into the Jazeera scheme itself. What should we do in future to stop off the movement of those dunes from the White Nile and the salty to the Jazeera? That's his okay. first question. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mohamed Omar. Um, Thank you. Yeah, to, to the first question, which was will the water quality of water coming from Ethiopia in the future affect salt problems in the Gezira? Um, we need to look at where the water comes from. The, the primary soils or, and the, the geology of that region is volcanic. And those basalts that were laid down 30 million years ago do not contain salt. When they weather, in fact, what you get is potassium, but you don't, you do not, they weather down to crack Montmorillonite clay, which is um, cracking clay, vertisol, and that's the type of silt that's brought in. So that's going to be the pattern in the future. The nature of the silts and sediments brought in will be the same. And the water quality will be the same. 
And the issues of salinity in the Gezira will not be affected by that. They will depend upon, there'll be local patches that are salty, but nothing to do with the water coming in from the dam. How to stop the sand dunes from moving across and migrating into the, into the Gezira, because sands are by their very nature mobile. Well, as His Excellency El Sadiq Ahmed said a moment ago, um, it, forestation, afforestation, reafforestation of the dunes is very important. And that is what will stabilize those dunes. Now you can begin by grow, putting grass, for example, tumam grass, Panicum turgidum, which incidentally you can eat the seeds of that, a wild grass. Then you can add um, things like uh, Salvadora persica, arak. Then you can introduce Caparis decidua, tundub, um, and then seal and other trees progressively. There's a very good forestry department in the University of Khartoum. There's a lot of expertise. There's been a lot of experimental work done on different um, trees for different soils. What I would advise not to do, don't plant eucalyptus trees because they're very thirsty. And there are, there's a lot of eucalyptus in Ethiopia, very fast growing. It's used for fuel, for building. And in the Sudan, in the Gezira, it's along the borders of the Gezira. But don't plant that on the dunes because that will take a great deal of the water in the dunes. Use Sudanese crops, Sudanese plants, use those to stabilize the dunes. If necessary, if the dunes are already very mobile, you can do as they do in China and in other parts of the world. You can put a mulch across it, or you can put um, areas of wheat stems or sorghum stems, and that will trap the haboob dust, and that will trap moisture, and then you'll gradually develop a soil on the dunes which will allow plants and trees to grow. So focusing on the dunes is important in terms of preventing sand blowing onto the good clay soils of the Gezira. So thank you for that question. Yes, uh, Professor Mohammed. Martin, back to the point that uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador, raised on those uh, years of drought and prolonged drought. What's, what's going to happen to Sudan? Uh, you, you mentioned when we doing the drastic practice run, climate change and flood years and dry years, uh, they definitely will come. It's a matter of, of just when. So oh, right. what are well, we going to do? Well, this is nothing new. We've had wet and dry years in the Sudan ever since people have lived there. And if you look at just the last hundred years, you have about 30 years of relatively wet years, 30 years of relatively dry years, 30 years of relatively wet years. And the plant, um, northern limit of plants in northern Sudan fluctuates accordingly. And they, uh, when the good years come back, the harif returns, the plants grow again. Um, it's something that Sudanese people have always lived with. So they have developed over the years a whole series of coping strategies to deal with these years. Irrigation was simply another means of coping with dry years. So I don't think you need to be pessimistic about the future. But as I said, you need to be flexible, opportunistic, and diversify. OK. Thank Muhammad. you. Our next Muhammad. question, uh, Dr. Muna. No, Dr. Before, Muna before, Adi, the, before, before Dr. Muna, Maifi, uh, Maifi, she asked the question in the chat. I believe. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I can read it, or if she wants to ask the question herself. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't. I come from an arts background, so so I'm just asking my best question. Um, I want to know if um, if we have to not remove faster from the environment um, than being able to replace it, and also not adding to the environment before we can use it up. 
Does that mean we really just want zero change? No. No? No, okay. not, no not at all. It's dynamic. Yeah, and I was about to say. Yeah. So, but is it dynamic because there's, there's no environment that works that way, but that's kind of the big goal is that we want this sort of sort of happy planet, which is oh, well. spoken about a lot in the media is this sort of big dream, this, you know, zero change, everything's great. But how do we do that in a dynamic situation? Oh, well, those two preconditions that I put forward, yeah. not systematically removing, not systematically adding, and maintaining maximum biomass it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the same biomass. Yeah, okay. But, and that's why I deliberately use the word humanly modified system or natural system. Okay. That's yeah. fine. Yep. Yep, so, that's fine. That's my, that's my whole questions. <laughs> thank you. All right. And good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well. Yep. Halas, Kafaya? Uh, just we got a question from Dr. Muna, and uh -huh. we got one question in the chat. Sure. Go on, Dr. Muna, please. If you are, I mean, you should be. Uh, I think she's a mute or something. Yep, yeah, most probably. Ah, you're muted. Unmute. Dr. Mona, if you can hear if she speak and I don't know how to unmute by let me do this. So you just need to unmute. Uh, she has to unmute. Some, yeah. In the meantime, I can read a question from the from the Facebook, Mohammed. Yes. Okay. yes, please. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Muawiyah Yahya uh, from the Facebook. Uh, I think he is. Uh, soil and water test center uh, for, from the soil and water test center in um, in the Lamarat, and there are many uh, uh, vocabularies that I might not be able to pronounce it well. So bear with me. It's, he said uh, the point of uh, smicitite or smictite minerals transported yearly sure will be impacted by the Ethiopian dam trapping, as referred in the data uh, from the Ethiopian highland. And his other point, second point is. Uh, regarding the potassium content of um, montemorlonite, I believe this is the right way to pronounce it, I'm not sure, but yeah. as measured by the radiation, yeah, yeah min mineralogical in different Blue Nile water samples location versus water densities in NTU. Also, this will make an impact of Jazeera and Bank of Nile soil as confirmed by the uh, CEC and contents. I hope I was able to uh, relay his question appropriate. Yes, yes. It's often assumed that the smectite family of clay, Montmorillonite clay, um, cracking clay, that um, is characteristic of the Gezira, is primarily derived from the weathering of volcanic rocks in the Ethiopian highlands. I'm currently engaged in research with colleagues from Australia who are clay mineral specialists, looking at the nature of the clay minerals in the White Nile soils. And to our surprise, what we found going back about um, 250, 300,000 years is that the dominant clay mineral in White Nile sediments is in fact smectite, not rillonite. Um, now, this is something that's been ignored by marine geologists working on marine cores in the Mediterranean. They've assumed that if they have a high concentration of this particular type of clay, or really like clay, it must have been the water flowing from the Blue Nile. Well, what we now know, and this ha we haven't published this yet, but we will in the next few months, I hope, we now know that Cracking clay, Montmorillonite clay, is also transported and has been ever since the White Nile existed. And so the, the soils 
deposited periodically along the lower White Nile Valley are also similar in their chemistry and cation exchange capacity to those deposited by the Blue Nile. However, because of climatic fluctuations in the past, the Blue Nile has not always carried these types of sediment, and nor has the White Nile. And this is what I tried to show you, that there's a complexity in time and in space in what's being transported today. And these major changes are what make up the Gezira today. The impact of the big dams, I think, will be relatively minor, in my view. And I could well be wrong, but I'm willing to be disproven. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the question. Yes, um, we have uh, Ali, just Dr. Join. Yeah, Munali, okay. Yeah. Dr. Muna, please. Mora, if you could uh, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. I think she just I think uh, she's a mute. Yeah, she just need to unmute. So uh, we have also another question from the Facebook in the meantime, or if you would like to ask another question uh, or get someone else, but let me know. Muhammad. Dr. Mohammed Alamin, he's been uh, raising his, uh, was he able to ask his question earlier? No. No. Yeah. He couldn't. Can we get the Facebook question, please, Dr. Mohammed? I think Dr. Ramona is ready to ask. She's a mute if she wants to. Go. Okay, great. Dr. Ramona? Assalamualaikum. Alaikum uh, salam. I want to ask about uh, how can uh, the evaluation in, uh, in Sudan be achieved to light the uh, climate change assessed by Ethiopian Dam? Uh, how can achieve the agricultural evaluation of Sudan? Hello? Yes, yes we I, hear you. We hear you. I didn't I didn't understand the question very clearly. So Mohammed Ahmed, can you Yes, uh, Dr. Mona is, is, is talking about or asking about the climate changes driven by the construction of the dam, and how can we evaluate the impact of the dam on the, in agriculture in Sudan? Of course, that includes the flood uh, irrigation around the river bank and uh, these things. She, she would like to see how can we go about evaluating the impact of the dam on the agriculture in Sudan? The, including the the flooding uh, irrigation and how the dam would affect the climate change. Yes, Professor Martin. Yes, I don't think the dam as such will have much impact on climate. The um, the amount of energy Im embodied in the summer monsoon is many orders of magnitude greater than any minor local change linked to a large body of water evaporating. Um, certainly big bodies of water do create their own microclimate. So Lake Victoria, for example, most of the rain falling on Lake Victoria in Uganda comes from evaporation from the lake. But the, when you look at the topography of the Blue Nile Gorge, it's very deep and very narrow. And you're not, gonna, you're not talking about a, a vast body of water, very extensive over a huge area. So evaporation losses will be relatively limited given the nature of the topography. I mean, in places, the Blue Nile Gorge is 1800 meters deep, um, 30 kilometers wide. And you know, it's big rivers flowing into it. So you, I'm not a climatologist and I'm not a hydrologist, but I would be surprised if there's any significant impact on climate. How it's going to influence the agriculture in the Sudan, um, 
is a bit like asking um, what was the impact of the Sanaa Dam on agriculture in the Sudan? What was the impact of the Rosaries Dam? What is the impact of the Kashmir Gilba Dam? All of these dams will influence the amount of sediment and the type of sediment being brought in. Only the finer sediment will, will be brought in rather than the coarse sediment. But overall, I don't think the dam will have any significant impact in the long run on agriculture in the Gezira. I think that will depend much more on the type of land use, the type of rotations, um, what crops are being grown, what fertilizers are being, being used, if any. I think it, it's too complex. It's oversimplifying to simply say big dam, therefore a problem. I don't see that as as the issue really. I think probably people are a bit over focused on it at the moment. And as His Excellency the Ambassador said earlier, it becomes a technical issue where the hydrologists, agricultural engineers, climatologists from Sudan, Egypt, Ethiopia, need to sit down and look at the science, look at the data and come up with some watertight recommendations. But I would not like to speculate any further about the dam. Uh, thank you. We are approaching uh, one hour and a half. Uh, we know uh, we talked much of your Dr. time, Mohammed, but uh, we got I a question. I about uh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Mohammed. Mr. Yes. Mohammed. Yes. Uh, I asked about how can the agriculture revolution in uh, in Sudan be achieved in light of climate change? Okay. I think he answered uh, that question. Affected by Ethiopian dam, uh, especially uh, since the uh, ecosystem in Sudan is uh, characterized by uh, by fragility. So, uh, Dr. Ramona, I mean, yes. during, if you, uh, this is a recorded uh, session, and I think the Professor Martin addressed uh, I, and alluded through his answers to some of how we can mediate this through the, you know, in an earlier answer. So we will be able to send it to you, and you already answered this specific okay. question. Can we take another okay. question from Saleh, if your time allows? Dr. Martin, uh, Professor Martin, I know we are approaching one hour and a half, and it's too late here in Australia, but if you don't mind, we take uh, Mr. One question, Saleh, question? The, from the Facebook also as well. Okay. You can read it. Uh, so Professor Martin can answer both together, Mohammed. Okay. So I will read the question and then we can take Dr. Saleh and if you want to conclude afterward, that will be great. So uh, this this question from Ammar Ali Adam Hamad, I believe. How to solve the, uh, the salinization problem specifically around White Nile areas in terms of climate change mitigation strategies without yield reduction. So I think you might answer this question before, but if you can include it uh, in your uh, uh, last statement. Thank you. Yes, okay. yes. We take question from Mr. Saleh as well. Oh, well, can I answer that one first? Yes, you can, Professor Martin. In one word, yes. hello fights. Salt tolerant crops, yep. which can then be used as fodder for animals. Yeah. Well, if you can just highlight, I mean, just for the audience, because not, not all of them might be experts. So, just examples. And I think you mentioned it earlier in the presentation as well. So, what's this, yes. what this type of plant? Yeah, there, there are various succulent crops, salt bush. There's, the United Nations Environment Program has published a major report on halophytes around the world and they're used in rangeland management and grazing. Um, there's a huge body of information. It would be sufficient to contact UNEP, ask for their information on halophytes as rangeland crops, as rangeland fodder for pasture. And the thing to do is not to regard salt as a problem, but as an opportunity. And that's why I deliberately in my final comments mentioned halophytes as one way to go. Okay. Thank you, Professor Martin. 
Mr. Saleh, are you there? Yes, thank you very much. Let me first thank uh, our colleagues in Harakat uh, Baladna for organizing this very important session. I am, I am also say, uh, sorry that I'm not being able to join from the beginning, but I can say, uh, yeah, in general, uh, it is about agriculture in Sudan. I have, uh, if I just take the, the what we call the large scheme, the large agriculture scheme or large schemes in, in Sudan. There is a known and general problem facing these uh, this, uh, uh, schemes, agriculture schemes. That is the low productivity of this scheme. That is Jazeera, Rahat, Halfa, and Suki. This, these are the, the large schemes. And they're characterized by their low productivity. Knowing that there is no problem in water availability. And I am saying this because I am from water resources and irrigation background. There is no problem in water availability. And there is no even potential risk for water uh, water availability from upstream development. Also, there is no uh, problem in other resources like land and uh, man, man uh, qualification in agriculture, but this is a, per, a persisting uh, problem of these schemes. The problem is that the two sides, agriculture and the irrigation, each one blames the other. They took their problems and they, agriculture, they say this is problem from irrigation and those from irrigation say, no, no, this is agriculture. There is a lot of studies from mid of 1980s, then 1990s, and you know all these studies from the World Bank, from National Tajasir, uh, and so on, to solve this problem, taking irrigation uh, to the agriculture sector, agriculture uh, people. Uh, but there is no, up to now, there is no any um, final and consolidated uh, equation that. You know, the problem they identified, it is a management problem. It is a management, because the resources are there. So my question to uh, Professor Martin, I'm, I'm very happy to, be, to see you. Uh, is there, from your experience, is there any, uh, from yours, there is any um, equations that we can apply to optimize or to guarantee at least optimum productivity of this, uh, these schemes. Uh, for example, irrigation, you cannot, it is 2 million in Jazeera, 2 million fadans or acres. They are all inter, interlinked. You have to have one, one management for irrigation. You cannot split, split this irrigation management in different sectors in schemes. The same in, in the agriculture part. Each, uh, change in, in any part will impact the other part. So there is a complexity. Uh, I would like to hear uh, the experience of Professor um, um, Martin Williams in this, how we can arrive to, uh, to some, some, to some uh, equations that we can optimize the productivity of large schemes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, detailed comment. It wasn't so much a question as a comment. And I fully agree with what you've just said. So yes. you're obviously very well informed and um, I couldn't add to what you've said. Yes, yes, so, true. It's a bigger problem now in Sudan it is a big problem because it irrigation belongs to the ministry. Yeah, irrigation for Jazeera scheme, for example, belong to uh, Minister of Irrigation and things and, and and this out of the scope of 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 this we here is specifically talking about uh, Professor Martin uh, knowledge about Sudan soil so we can shape the future for agriculture. Uh, we are about to close now. If uh, His Excellency Mr. Ambassador would like to say something or to thank Professor Martin in our behalf, I would, would like to thank. The audience, I would like to thank Professor Martin. Thank you so much. It's very, very, very detailed, okay. informative lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and, you, Doctor. Uh,
and I will introduce uh, His Excellency now to uh, thank, close this yes. uh, lecture today. Uh, um, um, thank you so much uh, for uh, Harakat Brelna for organizing this uh, for me very fruitful uh, session. Uh, I can say this is very high tech, but for me very informative one. And uh, we are in, in a real need for such uh, kind of uh, of informations exchanging. Um, uh, we have to 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 put all what it has been said, you know, in our consideration. I think what we heard is so very important, specifically with regard to the uh, to the the, the the visual vision of how to deal with the the the, the situation in, in in pertaining to the. Uh, the, the flood, uh, the sustainability of uh, the flooding of water, how to maintain, you know, the, um, the benefit from the, uh, the GRD, or uh, how to maintain, you know, the, um, the continuity of uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the agricultural uh, process. And at least uh, now we are all are prepared, you know, to to see the, the other uh, very advanced sites of uh, the building of this, uh, this dam, as we all hear that uh, we are going to guess, or we are going to, to practice a three seasonal agriculture rather than two, uh, as, as in the past. But I don't want to uh, add more rather than just saying that I'm very happy to take a part uh, in this uh, such a, a symposium. And uh, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, the moderators, Dr. Muhammad, and all those who uh, are taking part in this uh, session. And I hope that uh, such opportunities will be available for us to join uh, in the future. So thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Your Excellency. And it's been a real pleasure. Um, very high quality questions. I always judge the capacity of an audience by the quality of questions asked. And this is a very high capacity audience. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Ambassador. Thank you, the audience. And uh, see you again. Indeed. Thanks, uh, bye. Uh, thank you for coming. Martin, thanks, Mohammed. Uh, thank, thank you. It's good night. Thank you. Thank you, Good night. Night. Thank you for coming. And we will continue this series, and hopefully, we'll uh, be inviting Professor Martin again in some in the various topics he's very well informed about. And we will continue this in the future, inshallah. So, thank you very much. Inshallah. Thank you. 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 Bye. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.